Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Linda Peekshacht. I'm the executive director of the Nelson and Sue Andrews Institute for Civic Leadership here at Lipscomb University. We are so happy tonight to have in the audience so many good friends and so many students. I want to particularly recognize Bob and Shirley Garth, who because of their work with Don R. Elliott now make possible the Don R. Elliott Presidential Lecture on Economics and Politics here at Lipscomb University, and Jim Pinkerton. I also want to thank Sue Andrews, who is here, and uh, as the name of our institute uh, says, is one of the great supporters of us here in our work in the teaching of collaborative leadership for the common good. Throughout the audience are the inaugural class of the Masters in Civic Leadership program here at Lipscomb University, uh, as well as many undergraduate students, and I appreciate seeing you here tonight, as well as many uh, members of our leadership council and other community leaders, and we thank you for being here. Jim Pinkerton is known to many of you as a columnist in the American Conservative. He's known to others of you as a Fox News commentator. He's known to me and to some of you as a veteran of the Reagan and Bush White House. And he's here tonight because he's the creator of uh, uh, SeriousMedicineStrategy.org, a blog that he started to address what he believes are the important issues in healthcare, or dare I say, medicine, Jim. Um, thank you for welcoming him and for uh, also welcoming Debbie Tate, our executive in residence here at Lipscomb, former FCC commissioner, and as many of you know, a veteran of regulatory affairs here in the state of Tennessee as well. Debbie will be joining Jim after his lecture to kick off the Q&A, and so I hope you'll get your questions ready. He can talk about medicine, healthcare, or even about his latest gig as co-chair of RATE, Reforming America's Taxes Equitably. So please, without further ado, welcome Jim Pinkerton. Um, this is never quite where I want it to be. Uh, um, well, th thanks again to Mr. and Mrs. Garth, and thanks to everyone here at, at, at Lipscomb uh, for, for hosting me. And thanks all to Linda, who I you know, probably met 25 years ago. Um, <laughs> um, you know, the Parade Magazine this Sunday, Michael J. Fox on the, on the cover, uh, and they said, uh, you know, he's, obviously, he's been afflicted with Parkinson's, he's still working, he's an inspirational story in, in, in many, many ways, and as I suspect many of you know, he's created a foundation called the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's. And uh, so the, the, the interviewer asked him, said, well, uh, why did you create this foundation? And he said, because this is a, it's a paraphrase from the article, and he said, because there's no Department of Cures in the government. And uh, so we started one, you know, a private, a private version of it. Uh, um, now, Michael J. Fox is sort of up against, and we'll talk more about this, is the, the Food and Drug Administration, the, the, the tort bar, uh, and a general kind of, uh, um, I think, obliviousness to the importance of medicine and actual curing diseases as opposed to simply you know, paying for it and, and accounting for it. Um, but it's a question of, well, what, where is the Department of Cures is kind of worth wrestling with. And you know, first of all, is he right? I mean, after all, the National Institutes for Health spend about $30 billion a year. The um, R&D budget for the pharmaceutical industry, if you include everything, you know, is about 100, 100 billion a year and we spend more. Uh, now, of course, the healthcare spend in the country is about 2.6 trillion. So we're spending about 4% of our healthcare budget on R&D, which, you know, uh, uh, strikes me as kind of low uh, uh, relative to the challenge and relative to the amount of sickness and the number of people in, the, in, in this country. but. Even further, you might say, well, didn't we used to have a Department of Cures in this country, even if we didn't call it that? And, and the answer is that we did. Uh, under, under, never had that formal name, but uh, 150 years ago, if you went around the South, 
there's a decent enough chance you'd wind up with yellow fever or malaria at one time or another. Uh, these weren't necessarily fatal diseases, but they're certainly debilitating. Uh, and long before people figured out exactly what was going on with mosquitoes and, 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 and contagions and so on, they said, well, you know, if we drain swamps and live on higher land and so on, uh, we won't get uh, malaria and yellow fever. Uh, you know, and this is applicable to other things as well. Uh, the French had tried to build the Panama Canal in the 1880s, uh, and they all, all the workers died of malaria and yellow fever. And so when Theodore Roosevelt wanted to do it 20 years later, he said, oh, listen, the beginning process here is, is clearing away 1,000 yards of jungle on both sides, and that made it possible. Uh, when you know, cities in the north were full of tuberculosis and so on, and, you know, and, and, uh, they said, look, we don't exactly understand exactly how tuberculosis is transmitted, but we understand it has something to do with contagion. So we'll build sewers and sanitation and hygiene and give people lectures about all these, all these things, and we'll do that. Uh, as I was, the, the process of getting physicians to wash their hands before uh, surgery is that on anybody, every six months there's some horrible expose about the number of nurses and doctors who don't wash their hands, uh, but most of them do, and the death rate from those kinds of infections is down 99%. That was a cure. Uh, in 1938, uh, President Roosevelt uh, sort of created the, what was called the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis uh, to deal with polio, which was a major contagion scourge back then. Uh, it was a sort of a different world in terms of how things could work legally. And so perceptually, and sort of in fact, this National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis was kind of run from the White House. Uh, and so the, the radio public service announcements of the late 30s would say, send your dime to President Roosevelt. And the comedian Eddie Cantor heard that and said, oh, I get it, dimes, March of Dimes. And that you probably heard of, of course you have. And that was the late 30s and all through the 40s and into the 50s, uh, a visionary young doctor named Jonas Salk was working on the polio vaccine. And uh, in 1955, they had, the, they, had the, they, had, they had it done, they achieved it. Uh, in, in 1950, before the vaccine, the federal government had done a study that said that if present trends of polio continue, um, by the year 2000, we'll be spending $100 billion on wheelchairs, braces, iron lungs. And I guarantee these young people here have no idea what an iron lung is. An iron lung is something you would sit in, you'd be paralyzed from the neck down, and the only way you could survive, live, was if you had a, a, a air pressure pressuring your chest, so the, mimicking breathing from outside like somebody doing a permanent you know, uh, chest compression on you. Uh, people spent their lives. Obviously, they weren't very good lives and very long lives, but they would spend their lives in iron lungs. Uh, um, so that was, that was 1950, and $100 billion on nothing to do with a cure for polio, just the treatment of it, the treatment of the ravages of polio. And then the vaccine came along, and that 100 billion, by the way, 100 billion was relative to a, the then federal budget of 44 and a half billion back in 1950. And if you project 100 billion to the year 2000 and adjust for inflation, you get more like a trillion dollars. Um, we're, instead, we're spending zero because we did the vaccine. Uh, and during the same period of time, uh, we made a sort of a conscious decision to eliminate smallpox. It was actually sort of an interesting artifact of the Cold War. The, the Russians said, we want, Soviet Union said, we want to cure smallpox to save the third world and teach people about the glories of communism. So the United States government jumped in it too and said, no, to teach people about how great capitalism is, we'll, we'll eliminate smallpox. And it was sort of a virtuous kind of arms race between the two sides. And let's give both sides credit. Uh, smallpox was killing two million people a year, two million. Uh, as late as 1967. And if, by the way, if you survived smallpox, you were horribly pockmarked. It was just a completely disfiguring disease. Um, and by 1979, they'd eliminated it. There's no smallpox in the world. There's a little bit of the virus left uh, at the CDC in Atlanta. Uh, and unless we really get unlucky with Al Qaeda or something, it's gone forever. Uh, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, we made it, we, AIDS came along, it was a major crisis, there was an epidemic, there were all these horror stories about the entire world was going to die of AIDS, who knew? And 
a disease that nobody had any identification of at all in 1981 was a, a reasonably effective treatment called AZT was developed by 1987, and something called the cocktail was developed by 1996, and now AIDS is you know no fun to have, but it is at least in America if you're on your regimen, it is more akin to diabetes than to anything lethal. You know that's not true around the world, but it's true here. Uh, 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 that's progress. That is medical progress, and so why then would Michael J. Fox say there's nothing going on? Uh, um, on, on Parkinson's, and uh, the answer can, is sort of, unfortunately, he's sort of, he's, uh, I'm going to have a challenge here doing this with the mic, oh well, um, he's sort of right. There is nothing going on to speak of on medicine now. We, we are paying for health care. We're spending $2.6 trillion a year. We've had a, a major fight over health insurance, both in the Clinton administration uh, and then in the Obama administration, and in that entire discussion of health insurance, who should be covered, should, who should pay for it, should it be the government, should it be the private sector, should it be competition, should it be whatever, I, I really wager that this slide, this data, uh, um, let's go back, uh, well, that one, let's go back, I'm sorry. Uh, that slide there, was never shown. That's, that, that is new drugs approved by the FDA over, over since, since the 90s. And now as we look at current epidemics, we don't, we don't have to worry about smallpox anymore. We don't have to worry about you know, uh, polio. We do have to worry about Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a, afflicts about 6 million Americans at a total cost of about $172 billion a year. Uh, the, numbers are, the number of Alzheimer's victims is all of us baby boomers and everybody else gets older uh, is projected to quadruple in the next 30 years. Uh, the cumulative cost of Alzheimer's to the U.S. economy by, by the middle of this century is $20 trillion, with a T. And I would suggest that not only is that kind of a compassionate disaster in terms of, you know, loss of everything. It's also a financial disaster. It's a catastrophic financial disaster. Uh, 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 and and it, to me, it really doesn't matter whether the government is paying for it or the free market is paying for it. If you need 24-7 care for dementia, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost a lot of money, period. And I would, I would even further say that if somebody could develop a cure for Alzheimer's, not only would it be kind of cool in terms of us having a longer, better life, um, but we could raise the retirement age, perhaps, and th therefore deal with the entitlement issue that way and make the trade-off to people, you know, if I'm, I'm 54, you know, look, uh, uh, we're going to work on Alzheimer's, and the, the bad news is you're going to have to work five years longer. The good news is you'll know who your grandchildren are. And, and um, you know, I think that's a trade people would take. I also think there'd be an export market for that. You know, just a, just a hunch that people in China, people in India, people around the world who have the same kind of disease patterns uh, that, that we do uh, um, would be sort of would be sort of hungry for such a thing. And so, okay, well, that seems you know perhaps. And by the way, this let's go through this um, medical devices. Not not that different. Uh, decline. Uh, this, this, is, this is the trend line from the 60s, what it would have been um, you know, had it not declined. Uh, oh, we've heard about ant superbugs, and we saw the movie Contagion a year or two ago. Uh, number of new antibiotics approved, also down. Uh, uh, oh, and then, and then here now venture capital. Venture capital is down, not surprisingly. In a world, uh, for example, if if Glaxo uh, makes a, a drug called Avandia, a, a diabetes drug, and you know, uh, they can argue statistically that a certain number of people had heart attacks from Avandia, they, they, they take the drug off the market, and then Avandia loses $7 billion in liability, ask yourself, how many more diabetes drugs are they going to make? Not too many. Uh, uh, and so the, the field is sort of evacuating of uh, people leaving the, leaving the industry. And so this is sort of a summary of sort of where we are on medicine. And I would just submit to you that you could go look 
go get on the Washington Post website or the New York Times website or you know anybody else's website in terms of the news and also the think tank culture, both left and right, and you'll look long and hard or you won't find them, really. They'll talk about what's good for insurance. You should have, the government should guarantee you insurance, it should guarantee coverage, it should guarantee uh, uh, access, it should do all these things. Well, uh, and the, or the private sector should pay for it, or the free market should pay for it, or you should be empowered. You know, I, I have to tell you that most times when you go to the doctor, you're not really there for an ideological exercise about economics. You, you, it, maybe for shopping for LASIK. I say, I, I, I will now, I, I saw somewhere you can buy LASIK on eBay. That's, that's pretty good free market work in action. But if it's complicated, if, if it's your, your child, if it's your, you're under distress, uh, Kenneth Arrow um, won a Nobel Prize in, in 1972 for making the point that medicine is not a free market for one sort of obvious huge reason. You don't know much compared to the doctor. You can go to WebMD all you want, and if the doctor says this, 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 and this, and this, you're going to say yes. You're just not going to go to somebody you, who's, you're trusting your life to, or your, your spouse's life, or your kid's life, or your parent's life, and say, well, I'm interested in what you're saying. Give me your best estimate. Now I'm going to go troll around for a while to shop around and see what I come up with. Now this, this does work for a few things. I mean, you, you, can get a, you can get a hip replacement, and you can say, listen, it's cheaper to do it here, or, or it's worth it to go to this hospital for special surgery in New York. But for most illnesses that are really the science, that's what I call serious, for obvious reasons, it just isn't a free market decision. Now, on the other hand, would you then say, well, gee, I trust a bureaucrat with this decision? No, no. That's the story of the 2010 election, is they tried to say we have a bureaucratic plan for making health care cheaper. We're, we're going to reorganize it. We're going to hire some experts who are going to do this. Uh, uh, and we're going to model it after Western Europe. And we're going we're gonna to hope the American people like it. Well, you know, uh, the 2000, 2010 elections are kind of proof that the voters didn't, didn't like that. Um, but the 2011-12 period has been proof that when the Republicans say we're going to repeal Obamacare and replace it, A, they couldn't repeal it. And big part of that was they didn't have a replacement model. What's the Republican message on health care? Free market competition. It's just not what you need. I mean, if you, if, you, the, if you go to the doctor and you say, I have a broken hand or broken bone, they can fix it. It's relatively cheap. The hospital covers it. You pay for it, whatever. You don't really, frankly, you don't really care that much because it's, it's, it's your life first and foremost. If it's Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or many kinds of cancer, there's nothing. And that's the issue here is how do you begin the process of saying, why aren't we focusing on the epidemics that we face today? Alzheimer's, diabetes, cancers, neuromuscular diseases. Again, if you're, as the AIDS epidemic demonstrated, a really, really motivated activist group, gays and their allies, could change the world. They changed everything about medicine. And, and, and so there's more money being spent on AIDS research than most other diseases you know, put together. Again, if from their point of view, give them full credit. They actually pioneered all sorts of new ways of modeling uh, molecules and so on that are applicable to a million different fields. But you might just ask yourself when you think about what killed your great grandparents and relatives and so on like that, is there a similar effort for them or for you? The answer is I'm not, I'm not sure there is. As a matter of fact, I know there isn't. And that's kind of the point. At some level, we have to get through our heads that accounting for people's sickness and shuffling, well, you get an accountable care organization, you get this, and you get this, and that. It's, it's not a bad idea. By the way, the voters don't trust you at all on this. Anybody who's a policymaker, anybody who's an elected official is trying to say, listen, we're going to manage things better and save money on health care. Believe me, Sarah Palin will be calling you calling it a death panel, and, you know, and, and you, you will not profit from the experience. No, but if you're a governor of a state, you got to do it. You just realized, as a, member, a Republican member of Congress told me a couple years ago, health care is a loser for whichever party is in charge, you know, because you just get blamed. And I said, you know, I'm sure you're right in terms of your analysis, but ask yourself, how messed up is that? Healthcare is what you want. You turn on a television. There's, there's you know, nip and tuck and ER and, you know, everything else. And people care about medicine. They care about the house. They care about, the, they want the eccentric, crazy doctor to save their lives through some in, innovative, brilliant treatment. That's what they want. 
and they'll pay for it too, not just out of their own pocket, but collectively we'll say that's an important thing, we want the government to do that. Uh, TV commercials, you turn on the TV, what are they all about? Bones, COPD, you know, everything and so on. People want it. So how did we get in our heads that, oh, we're spending too much on health care, we had to crimp down? It was a policy decision from Washington with enormous help from the Kennedy School and sort of the chattering classes across the country and so on, who defined health care as a cost. Nobody worries about what we spend on IT in this country. You know, I, I'm old enough to remember, you know, uh, and I'll take Linda with me on this, you know, back in the days of IBM typewriters and so on, uh, uh, you know, IT was nothing. IT was you and a calculator. Now IT is everything. Uh, uh, and it's about, actually, coincidentally, it's about 20% of GDP now. It's not surprisingly, given Facebook and Google and everything like that. And everybody loves it. And they, when it comes to healthcare, oh, we're spending too much. Now, the irony of all this is that what's called the cloud or big data or any number of other names for it, is in fact going to deal with this somehow if we wanted it to. You know, the same venture capital that is turned loose on Facebook 2.0 and Pinterest and, you know, Yelp and everything else going on out there is potentially for this too. And Sergey Brin, I mentioned Parkinson's. Sergey Brin, who you all know, the co-founder of Google, has a mother and an aunt with Parkinson's. So you know where that leaves him, down the road somewhere. And he has said, I want to data crunch my way to a cure. It was in Wire, the cover of Wired magazine a couple of years ago. Uh, um, and he's saying, look, we can just sort of skip past, we can al use algorithms to sort of skip past all the white mice and human, sus human subjects and so on and so on. Maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong. But if he is right, and you can start cranking out cures out of a computer, uh, 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 the way you crank out new you know, applications for your iPhone, that would be pretty impressive, that would be pretty cool. And I guess my concern, though, is that, and again, as mentioned about Michael J. Fox, he has no idea. I mean, he, he's a smart enough man, but he's not up to grips with, he hasn't cured Parkinson's yet. He's, his foundation's been in existence for 12 years. I don't, I don't blame him for that at all. What I will say, though, is that the correlation of forces, the people fighting him, whether they admit it or not, are pretty darn powerful. Food and Drug Administration. You know, a, 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 a Republican member of Congress told me, Congressman Fahrenthold of Texas, that if the FDA were confronted with aspirin now, they'd say no. Too many side effects, too dangerous, whatever, whatever. The reality of the FDA is that if you're the FDA commissioner, any one of us being the FDA commissioner, and they said, uh, um, you know, here's a new drug, and you could say, well, listen, you could approve it, and somebody could keel over tomorrow, and you get blamed. Or you could approve it, and it would cure people 10 years from now, and you'd never get credit. You know, what, what do you want to do? What, what, what do you say, chief? And, uh, and the trialers, I mentioned them about Avandia, you go down the list of every other drug, I mean, you turn on TV, 1-800-BAD-DRUG, you've all seen that. You know, every, every drug in the world is being sued. Uh, uh, this, is, this, is, this is not a strategy for reversing those trends. And I, and I, and I think we need one. I think we, this is about as important an issue as we face as a country. And some of you heard me earlier today saying that the political system in Washington is so ideologically driven that the left says the government has to solve this problem, not the medical problem, the insurance problem, or the right says the free market has to solve this problem, not the medical problem, the insurance problem. And I think that my concern is neither is getting there, and in the meantime, these kind of horrible trends, which leave us in the worst of all possible roles, which is paying for people to get sicker and sicker, being compassionate enough to care for people, but not smart enough to cure them. I think that's a huge mistake. Thank you for listening. I'm sure we have time for questions. Debbie? We're going to try to get that static out. I'm so excited to be here, and I'm really thrilled to meet somebody. I feel like I'm a groupie, you know, not for a band, but for somebody that um, has a great mind and intellect. And for you students, you all just don't know what a real treat it is to have somebody like Jim Pinkerton in Nashville, and especially here at Lipscomb. So thank you again. He couldn't be here without my handing him, of course, our local uh, non-diabetic 
uh, Goo Goos. You, you, um, you, you promise. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but it's a great story. I'll tell, tell you a little bit about it later. Um, it, it's also so timely that Jim happens to be here because he, he has obviously thought so much about health care. Um, given the fact that the Supreme Court has been considering, and many of you all probably listened to some of the arguments. Um, and I just didn't know if you followed it, want to give us your thought or your take on 5-4 and what that might do also for the election coming up. Right. Well, on, on, on the 5-4 decision, I mean, look, I have no idea. You know, uh, 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 you know William Goldman, the famous Hollywood screenwriter you know, who won two Oscars for Butch Cassidy and... and, and uh, uh, Chinatown, uh, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, they asked him, okay, sum up your 40-year wildly successful career in Hollywood in terms of what works and so on. And he says, let me tell you, nobody knows anything. Okay, that was his wisdom, you know, in terms of nobody knows who's going to win. Nobody knows who's going to win the Oscar. Nobody knows that Hunger Games is going to be a huge hit and John Carter is going to be the biggest bomb ever. Nobody knows. Uh, 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 I actually interviewed uh, uh, James Cameron before Titanic. I wouldn't get to him now, but I got to him before that, <laughs> and, and uh, he was terrified. But you know, he said, Gee, "Did my career peak with Terminator?" I mean, you know, he didn't know. Uh, 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 I will just so I don't know what will happen on the court, but I will say this: is that whether the the conservatives win and Obamacare is repealed, or whether the liberals win and Obamacare is vindicated, it will not make any difference to your future medical situation. In other words, the, the, your, your medical future is, your health future, your life is going to be determined by whether you manage to avoid getting muscular sclerosis or muscular dystrophy or ALS or Alzheimer's or you end up in a war and having your spinal cord shattered by a bomb somewhere. You know, there, there are 20-year-old, you know, young people who went to Afghanistan and back or Iraq and are now in wheelchairs the rest of their lives. Uh, <clears throat> some of you may remember, you know, Christopher Reeve, the actor, you know, had a, had a spinal cord injury in 1995. And, and, and for the 2000 Super Bowl, this is you know, 12 years ago, they had a, a new veen, which was an investment company back then, had a little image of him getting up. They, they photoshopped it to make him get up and walk to receive some prize or something like that. That was 12 years ago. So people have always had this vision of people who were paralyzed. Uh, 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 being able to walk, but they but they haven't really worked very hard on it. Uh, there's an issue. There's an article in the current issue of Fast Company magazine about uh, 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 the Pentagon funded effort at sort of robotic legs, which actually is sort of working. It's, it's a company called Exo, which is out, out in California. There's 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 something going on there, um, but the mere fact that you're either getting have a mandate to pay your health insurance or you don't have a mandate, or whether the free market is doing it or the insurance companies are doing it, or the government's doing it, will not affect the course of medical research because the, the, the really powerful forces today, absent any political input from people who merely want to be healthy, uh, the FDA is under pressure from the government, the rest of the government, not to approve expensive drugs. Uh, Avastin is a breast cancer drug, for example, and um, Avastin is about $80,000 for a three-month course, which will extend your life for about three months. You know. now, the FDA has said, well, that's too much. That's not really, it's not really worth it. Uh, uh, um, I guess my answer, part of my answer says, uh, uh, how, how, like any other technological project, you know, whether it's computers or anything, airplanes or anything like that, the prototype is hideously expensive. And after that, it tends to get kind of cheap, you know, to the point where, you know, you're cranking out cell phones and, you know, aspirin and whatever else, the price of dirt, practically, in terms of what it costs them to make, whatever they sell it for is a different story. And how, how do you want to get from a Bastin 1.0, which we now have, to a Bastin 2.0, to 3.0, to 4.0? You're going to have to take some risks in terms of doing this, and the government says no. So that, I guess that's my answer is whatever the court does, uh, uh, who knows? I mean, in terms of the bad, bad prospects for medicine. It isn't going to make us it's not going to make healthier. It, I afraid not, no. Right. One of the things I wanted to share with you was a quote um, back to uh, Jim's example of Alzheimer's. He talked a little bit um, in an article about Maria Shriver and I guess Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, and you said, longer lives, money saved, talk about a win-win, curing is cheaper than caring. You know, and I just think some of these ideas are incredible. So, so what's next? How are you going to move this from this speech at Lipscomb? What's next? 
you don't think this will do the trick? <laughs> 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 well, you've sold all of us, right? Um, I mean, it, it, look, it, it's, you know, those of you in school, will, you'll have to take a course on the origins of the Civil War or the origins of World War I or World War II or whatever. And the answer is that all great events, and I mean great events, better or worse, is huge events have multiple causes. Okay, you go through it and you say, well, this, this is the reason, this is the reason, this is the reason. And I think that we've gotten to the point where the, a, a, quote, healthcare expert will talk about insurance and finance and access and so on with, with never, without mentioning medicine has many, many causes. There's been sort of an effort to sort of replace doctors with bureaucrats and economists and lawyers and so on. I mean, you look about who, you know, those, I'm sure everybody here has been to Washington at one time or another. If you look at who congressional staff is, or you go to a think tank and look around, they don't have scientists. The original think tank was the RAND Corporation, you know, Research and Development. It was created in California in the 1940s. They were working on things like radar, you know, in the Advanced Physics Laboratory at, at, at Johns Hopkins. They were working on the proximity fuse. They were doing technical scientific stuff. Somewhere in my lifetime, the think tank went from being a science thing where you, you know, work on g gadgets and inventions and so on to a bunch of people who argue about economics and fiscal issues and theory and econ what would Adam Smith say about this? What would Karl Marx say about that? What would, you know, the, what does Greenpeace think? What does the Cato Institute think? It changed and, and, you know, we probably all had occasion to reflect on how America shifted from manufacturing to sort of finance and real estate and so on. I don't think this trend was entirely healthy for the country, frankly, uh, to, to do this, but it did. And I think the medicine aspect is a part of that. I think that in the 1970s, the environmental movement came along and said technology is alienating, it's causing pollution, it's hurting people, it's, you know, a, it, uh, it's, it's do not fold, spindle, and mutilate. There's all these sort of, sort of semi kind of anarchist libertarian thoughts running through the culture, left and right. And out of that came this idea, well, yeah, we don't want too much science and medicine. We want to have a good death. We want to go quietly. Well, actually, most people don't. You know, when it gets right down to this, it's one, fun thing to talk about theory, or just let me go any time. Well, actually, when it comes to you want a heart transplant at 92, you, you do want it, or a hip replacement or whatever. And, and my argument is, that's not bad. That's actually kind of how the economy, you know, any economist will tell you that, you know, wants are insatiable. Now, this offends some people to think that everybody just wants more, more of everything, but it's sort of reality. And those wants extend to medicine, too. I want to live longer. I want to be healthier. So do all the rest of you. And yet, you know, take Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs probably was doing pretty well in his life. He was worth 5 or $10 billion in 2009 when he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And then all of a sudden he discovered, gee, we don't have a cure for that. Sorry. So he's dead. Not only is that a loss to us Mac, Apple, fanboy cultists like me, but it's a loss to all of you, and it's a loss to the economy, it's a loss to his family, it's a, it's a huge loss, but it's sort of too late for him to kind of go back and say, well, wait a second, I should have been thinking about this 10 years ago and using the cultural cachet that I had from the iPod and the iPhone and everything else to sort of say, look, why aren't we fixing this? Why aren't we harnessing Moore's law and all the good that it can do in terms of supercomputers to the challenge of creating medicine as opposed to just you know, new derivative products for Goldman Sachs? <laughs> Thanks. So I'm just back from Barcelona and the World Mobile Congress where I saw every gadget known to man. And many actually have to do with healthcare, which was really, really exciting to see. Most of those um, are actually made by our global competitors and not here in the United States. And while I was at the FCC, I remember when big mergers would come in front of me, one of the one of the questions that I always ask, would ask is how is this going to work for America's global competitiveness? That it wasn't just competing against American companies anymore, it's worldwide. So um, I, I really wanted to ask you a little bit just about the rate commission and about the fact I saw an article about this device tax on uh, causing medical companies to lay off workers. Um, Stryker was laying off 5% of its workforce. Other device makers have announced other layoffs um, because and plan to move the production of their devices offshore. So, you know, we have the highest now, I guess, corporate tax rate in America. We have taxes on things like creating these incredible new devices that actually might help with solving some of our health care issues. So tell us, you didn't really get into Yeah, the I didn't. No, there's, there's two or three, there's two or three yeah. issues here, and I want to I talk about the Barcelona thing as well. Look, every, you know, 
gadget maker in the world, is, as Debbie said, is working on something that will monitor your pulse or your blood rate or whatever it is. And that's incredibly valuable and useful, and I guarantee we'll all be buying them. It'll be an app on your iPhone or your Droid, and you'll say, oh, gee, that really helps a lot. What we're missing, though, is the kind of big solution that's inherent in this, which is Facebook and Google didn't get to be so rich and so powerful by simply selling you apps. They had your data. They know all about you. If you have Gmail, as I do, Google knows everything about you. If you have Facebook, as I do, they know everything about me. Uh, Twitter, same thing. And so the real value in any system is the size of the network. Okay? You know, those of you who are sort of computer-oriented know about Metcalfe's Law, which is that the, the value of a network is a square of the number of nodes on the network, which is to say that if a network is 2, the value is 4. If the, value, the network is 4, the value is 16. Network is 16, the value is 256. It's, 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 it's completely you know, ex exponential. And the only way that these medical networks really become valuable is when all the data gets shared. Uh, the FAA, for example, shares the data of all the airlines. Okay, so, and this is enormously valuable for feedback on air safety. In other words, if, if, if the, the FAA takes all the data from all the airlines, this has been going on for decades. Uh, and, 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 and anonymizes it, so it's not specific to any airline, simply says, this many airplanes flew this far at this temperature, and they had this many cracks in the wings, and the tires need to be placed this often, and so on. And it's been an enormously fruitful exercise, and the death rate from aviation, civilian aviation, is down about 99% in the last 60 years, okay? There's a feedback process there, and this has been going on before anybody invented really to speak of the, the, you know, the modern computer and the modern database and so on, but they've just been using this to great effect. And by contrast, it's not happening on medicine. A doctor will record about 1% of the data he gets from you. And it's not because he's a, he or she is a bad doctor. It's because he or she is busy. That's one factor. You, were, you might not be thinking if, when you come in with a headache to say, well, gee, I also have a pain in my elbow, and maybe the two are connected somehow. But a computer would catch that. Now, Google and Facebook are catching that, for, gee, uh, if you're going to see, you know, Hunger Games and you read Harry Potter and you read, uh, you know, uh, uh, Percy Jackson, we know you're 12 years old and therefore you're probably <laughs> not, you know, uh, eligible to be on Facebook at all. That's kind of, that's sort yes. of the, 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 there's a million ways to use this data. And keeping it and storing it and scraping right, it right. and selling. Right, and, and so you can say, and this is a major public policy issue for privacy, that we don't want people to know all about our choices and habits. Perfectly fair. When it comes to medicine, when it comes to your health, you do. Now, you don't want it personal to you. You don't want your employer discriminating against you and so on. But again, this is why the FAA model is so valuable, because the FAA has used the data in a way that doesn't hurt any one airline, and, and they don't feel bad about contributing data. You know, look, a, a guy dropped a wrench on a, a motor blade and the, you know, the plane crashed, I mean, a horrible tragedy, and they got legal problems for that, but they don't get down into the weeds on this. The only thing is say, listen, if you, if you ding a blade by accident, just take the whole engine out. You know, but they, they make those kind of policy decisions, and it's enormously, enormously fruitful. So what we'll, what, what we'll ha we've all had the experience of going to the doctor's office. You sit there with your clipboard. You fill out all the data, your name, rank, serial number, blood type, whatever it is. And then you, you, you go next door down, you do it again. Or actually, uh, uh, is it you telling, Bob, is you telling me about? No, it was, um, I'm losing it here. Is it you? Some, somebody was telling me you had the experience of going to the doctor, and then they type it in again. I'm, I'm getting a little sloppy here, but, but you know, <laughs> you, type, you write it in, and then you go down the hall to the nurse receptionist, and she then types it into the computer, and you do it all over again. So but we've all had that kind of experience. That's crazy. That's poor planning, and Facebook and Google and Intel would be out of business if they operated like that. And we need that for medicine, too. But you won't get there until you deal with the, basically, with well, privacy issue is one thing. You can deal with that the anonymous way. The other issue is legal liability. The moment, that, look, suppose there's a dream world. In my case, I'm 54. There's a dream world where they had all the data for every 54-year-old male in the country, in the world, and said, well, gee was you know, when you have chest pains, it also means you're this, and whatever, and here's your little sequence and protocol and so on. That would help my life enormously. It would help all of your lives enormously because all the men in this room will turn 54 and the women probably will turn 54 too and, and they don't admit it. And they'll all have to deal with these kinds of issues. And, but the challenge is if that, that data existed somewhere, John Edwards would sue for it. John Edwards would say, well, okay, now I have somebody, Jim Pinkerton just killed over for a heart attack. 
So now I, 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 smell, I smell a lawsuit here somewhere. So I'm going to search the database for every 54-year-old and conclude, ah, yes, Pinkerton took, you know, uh, you know XYZ drug. And we can sue over that. It's a huge issue. It's kind of subtle, but it, it's, it's crippling the ability of all these machines in Barcelona and everyone else to talk to each other. And again, it's not a political issue, but you do see the consequences in this, in this thing. That, so then there's, that's a tax on the system, is the, the, the trial lawyer tax on the system. Now, you mentioned shifting gears here a little bit, the rate, the rate coalition. Uh, I'm also, you know, as she asked, uh, 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 oh, I'm perfectly proud of it. Uh, the co-chairman of a group called uh, the Rate Coalition. It's uh, reforming America's taxes equitably. It's 27 uh, Fortune 200 companies who are working to reduce the corporate income tax in America from 35%, which affected April 1st, it's the highest in the world. Uh, Japan cut its rate, uh, uh, and now we're the highest. And so all the things I'm talking about in terms of medical innovation and, and all these companies and so on that are moving overseas and laying people off, uh, it's also applicable to every other corporation in America and every other corporation in the country and making their decisions. And of the 500 largest corporations in the world 10 years ago, uh, 10 years ago, 160 of them were headquartered in the United States, and today 120 are. You know, if you think about what any city any state wants more than anything else in terms of economic development, it's a corporate headquarters, right? Nobody, they, everybody gets paid a lot of money. They all hire lawyers, PR people, communications, HR, you know, everything. It's a kind of a prestige thing for a city to have a, you know, a, 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 a corporate headquarters. And when you lose one, like Los Angeles has had a huge hemorrhage of them in the last 10 or 15 years, you, you go from sort of a one rank of a city to another rank of a city, you go downward. Uh, so we're, we're part of that, and, and, and I'm part of helping on that. We've had an event yesterday in Columbus, Ohio, with Senator Portman of Ohio and a, a Republican member of Congress uh, as well, talking about this. Um, the reality here is that we're in a competitive world, and capital is mobile, and we, it, it, the decisions that are made in Nashville, in Tennessee, in America, in North America, have enormous consequences as to whether or not the kind of capital investment that creates medicine, the kind of capital investment that creates any kind of technology you can think of, any kind of growth you can think of, any kind of job you can think of, it's sort of a choice. I and mean, the thing that would, I guess, connect serious medicine to the economy is, you know, you make decisions about what you want your country and your economy to be, and they either work or they don't work, and you kind of study it. And you say, well, well okay, what, what, where's the feedback here? Did this, was, it, was it successful? in doing this in terms of creating jobs and growth in our, in our country or not? And we all have answers to those questions, but one answer from a lot of economists, including the Obama administration, is that the corporate tax rate is too high. The president said in his State of the Union address in January, he said that we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. And in February, the Secretary Geithner said we want to reduce it to 28 from 35, we're not where we want to be at 25, which is the average of our competitors. Uh, um, so that's the beginning of a long process. I mean, again, nobody's under any illusions that 2012 was going to be a moment of kumbaya in terms of the Congress and politics and so on. Uh, um, but we, we, as we like to say, everybody has an idea for tax reform, you know, flat tax, fat rate tax increase, you know, who knows what it is. But some ideas, like the idea of a lower rate and fewer loopholes and a broader tax base, are sort of have a kind of equity among both parties. Uh, back in 1986, President Reagan and then House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Rosenkowski, a Democrat of Illinois, worked together to create the 86 Tax Act, which was a huge success, and frankly made both parties happy in terms of being able to go back home to the voters and say, look at me, I just did something good. Um, so we, we're cautiously optimistic that could happen in 2012, and more, more optimistic that it'll happen in 2013, just because the, there's 8.3% the unemployment and slow growth, and this is the recovery, the economic recovery from this recession, from 08, 09, uh, it's about half the rate of what the historical average is, half. Uh, and that's, that's a bad thing for everybody in this room. We need to have some questions. I've got plenty of other questions, but I'd love to um, have you all ask a question, David. And then we need to have a student ask a question. So you all raise your hands or be thinking about a question. Well, first of all, I agree. Is this on? Yeah. I, I agree with so much of what you're saying. and. Uh, I am going to just ask you, challenge you a little bit on two points. I don't, I don't want that to detract from the fact that I think you got it exactly right. We're focusing on the wrong things. Um, but uh, this, these trends here and the trend you had in the pharmaceuticals, I wonder if it's not a little bit along the lines of 
there's a reason that the wheel was invented slightly before the microchip. And I, and I just, I, I wonder if, if what we're seeing is that the, the low-hanging fruit keeps being reaped and then uh, the stuff that's left is pretty difficult. I know that recently a number of the uh, pharmaceutical companies have uh, laid off uh, all or most of their neuroscience team, which is a subject that's very close to my heart, as Debbie knows. But um, the reason for that is that they feel that the, the drugs that are out right now, the research that, has been, that is out there now, has taken care of 90% of the demand, and that the, the tough stuff is now left with 10% of the demand. And that list of pharmaceutical new drugs that were introduced, part of that is look-alike drugs. So you get these major breakthroughs like the first you know, Lipitor and things like that, and after that, the, the, the market uh, value of any incremental improvement just falls off precipitously. So I wonder if that's part of the, of the issue. And then just something else to think about. You talked about the basically the predictive modeling and the liability that presents and the opportunity for the trial lawyers. Um, and being in healthcare, I look at it from the opposite perspective, and that is that not only would the attorney know what is the most likely protocol for the treatment of a 54-year-old with hypertension or whatever else, but so would the doctor. And I think one of the problems we have today is that medicine has become so complicated that the probability that any of us receive a proper diagnosis and the cur most current known treatment, effective treatment for our condition is about 50%. And that's not a fault of the medical field. It's a fault of the system not yet catching up with the complexity of it. So I'm just going to throw yeah, those, those are two good points. I, I think I, I agree, completely agree with the premise of both. But let me just uh, add, add a couple things. One, on this complexity, um, everything is complex in surgery. And, and that's what you have scientists for, and engineers, and computer scientists, and algorithms. In other words, uh, you're right. Everybody in this room has had the experience, either personally or from the family member. You go to three different doctors, you get three different diagnoses. And that's inherently expensive. I mean, one of the challenges we face is, is the reality that healthcare today is extremely labor intensive. There's a lot of nurses, a lot of doctors, and so on. And what we really want is to push as much of the medical curing healthcare experience away from having to seek an expert to do it and do it yourself. And I'm not an anarchist here. I'm just pointing out, for example, that uh, uh, heart disease, to take your other point, uh, you know, heart disease in the 1950s heart disease, you know, you read an old book, you see an old movie, the guy dies of a heart attack at 52, you know, and that's the end of him. And that was pretty standard. Uh, 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 President Eisenhower had a heart attack in 1955. Uh, you know what his treatment was? Leader of the free world, access to the best health care on the planet, his treatment was bed rest. Now, today, of course, we know that actually bed rest is a bad treatment. You sit in bed for six weeks, your, your heart problem would be compounded with bed sores and clots and whatever else. They were doing the best they could. And when they're feeling radical in the 50s, they'd give you an oxygen tent, which really didn't do any good at all, except maybe keep you from smoking. Uh, uh, um, and, and so, but then, oh, that, and they, they were, it wasn't for lack of trying, it was for lack of knowledge. And then in the late 50s and early 60s, they, they, to deal with this problem, they invented open heart surgery. Now, open heart surgery is kind of ancient now. I mean, some people still get it, I mean, you know, uh, uh, but it's unbelievably expensive. The infection rate, what they call nosocomial infections from the hospitals and so on, is it kills like 100,000 people a year, not all from open heart surgery, but across the board. Uh, it's a long time to recover. It is frantically expensive. And people say, well, that's not really sufficient. So they kept working at it, and they kept digging at it and so on, and they say, okay, how about uh, angioplasties? You know, uh, a balloon through your arteries, uh, or veins. Uh, how about a stent, a permanent thing in your arteries and so on? Now, now you're getting cheaper. Uh, 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 this is something you can do in an outpatient procedure. Your doctor just puts it in you and, and you go home that day. Uh, how about statin drugs? You mentioned the, 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 the block questions. In other words, um, now those are, you know, then they go off patent and they're really, now, you know, a, a generic statin drug is cheap as dirt. And if that's too expensive for you or you, just, if you don't feel like you want to be that medical, uh, try an aspirin tablet. Uh, try garlic pills. I, again, I, I'm 54. I, Ten years ago, I was having what I took to be the beginning of kind of a little bit of angina. So I resolved to exercise more, which of course I didn't do. Uh, um, and I started taking aspirin and garlic, and I don't, I don't have it now. You know, and that's, 
That's my own little story. And again, it would be enormously useful to the system if my little anecdote of that story, my little case study, could be put into a database. It's not. There's no database in the world that has my little tale about that, because I haven't had anybody to tell it to. I'm telling all of you, you're free to blog it somewhere. <laughs> but the point is, there's no <laughs> United Health or the government or Pfizer is not using me as an example of how to do this. And they're not learning from me. Facebook is learning from all you, of all of us in terms of how, what we bought yesterday and what we like and didn't like and so on like that. They're not learning from us. And so the only way to deal with this is to say, look, we want a similar process now for things we don't have a handle on. Uh, uh, neuromuscular diseases is a great, autoimmune diseases is a great example. Uh, you know, many kinds of cancers, al Alzheimer's. The, the low-hanging fruit may well have been plucked. You know, uh, uh, um, the low-hanging fruit on a sailing ship was sort of mastered probably in 1000 BC, and that was a sort of living off of that for 2,000 years until the steam engine came along, and then you start all over again. My, my point is that we've got such an unbelievable crisis on our hands that we better start jacking up the process to deal with this. And, and if that requires the government stepping in or an X prize, if those of you know what the X prize is for orbital science and so on, and you know going to the moon and all those other X prizes, maybe we need that. Maybe we need an enterprise zone somewhere. Uh, uh, and say, look, folks, we don't know for sure this will work. Maybe, maybe we're at some dead end. Maybe we'll never solve this problem. But I, I think you know, Arthur C. Clarke, the famous science fiction writer, said any time that, that a young scientist says, I've got an idea that will solve a problem, and an old scientist says, no, that can't be done, bet on the young scientist. You know, that's just so we, so if, if you know, we had no plan for building the A-bomb in 1939, we had no idea. We had no idea it would work. You know, we had no idea anything. The President Roosevelt said, we better start doing this, otherwise we're going to get in this infantry battle with the Nazis and the Japanese and whoever, and we'll have you know, five million casualties. Uh, you know, this estimates are that uh, uh, um, you know, uh, there would have been a million Americans killed invading Japan, a million. He said it was zero. Now, it wasn't the A-bomb's not the perfect answer to everything, but it was nonetheless, <laughs> it was, seemed like a good idea at the time. And I'll, I'll just say that. And, and uh, 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 so sometimes you have to simply ignite the process for yourself uh, otherwise, you're just in deep trouble. I think instead of think tanks where we just think, we need solution tanks. So maybe we need to start one here. Okay, one student. Do you have one right here? Okay. Uh, oh, Mr. Pinkerton, thank you for uh, coming here. Thank I'm you. Chris Garrett. I'm one of the uh, students in the Andrews Institute for Civic Leadership. The steps that you describe in terms of the government stepping in to the process kind of run counter to uh, sort of the national narrative of government getting out of the way. I'm wondering how we can sort of change the narrative so that the crisis that you're describing becomes more of a priority. I, I think you're exactly right. Uh, uh, and that's part of, the, part of the reason this is happening, is that the, the general view is, well, healthcare is sort of connected to the government, and the government screws everything up, and it's the post office, and, you know, and so it's a disaster, so don't do it. And as I said earlier, the NIH spends $30 billion a year, and they, frankly, from a your point of view, they waste most of it. I'm not at all against science, and, I, and if you want to give some scientists money to go study birds and stuff, that's okay. But don't call that a cure. Don't don't take money away from the cure pot to the scientific speculation pot. Do frankly, in my view, do both. I'm, I'm a big fan of scientific research. You never know what you're going to get, but it's really really clear that you know the the public is skeptical. If I gave this pitch to a lot of people, I'm sure many in this room are saying, "Well, that's all nice, but it'll never happen. The government will screw it up, and so on." Um, maybe they would. And so I guess my, if, if I were an ambitious politician, I'd say, listen, I'm not going to use the government. I'm going to try an enterprise zone. I mean, I've mentioned that before. I'm going to try, uh, I'm going to go to Bill Gates and Steve, well, no, not Steve Jobs, but Bill Gates and whoever else and say, from a completely blue sky perspective, tell me what you want. I want you to commit a lot of money to curing Alzheimer's. And if you tell me there's no taxes, no trial lawyers, no FDA, now we're just discussing. It's sort of like what a mayor does or a governor does. A governor says, listen, we're, I'm desperate to get this company to stay in Nashville or relocate to Nashville or whatever, and so I want to hear what you need to do it make it happen. And then it's just a bunch of political choices. What I, what I am confident, though, is that the political support for such a program would be enormous, even in spite of the, the cynicism. I mean, I think cynicism is more uh, 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 superficial than, than deep, I really believe that if some 
politician got up and said, you know, I think Alzheimer's is the biggest crisis we face, and I think we ought to cure it, and I think we ought to use the private sector and use an enlightened government and maybe throw in the military a little bit because people trust the military more than they trust a lot of the government. I think people would vote for it. And I've actually been saying that in Washington for three years, and I got to confess, I get a lot of what you're, exactly what you're saying. Oh, even from Democrats. Oh, I, it really wouldn't work, you know. And, and let's focus on. We know we can deliver health insurance. We, we know that we can sign a piece of paper that says that 100 percent of the people in the country are covered. Yeah, are they getting good coverage? No, not really. But we, but they at least can say they're getting covered. <laughs> that, that's that's the that's the metric that we establish for ourselves. Uh, 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 but I'll tell you, one, one, one member of Congress who, who voted for Obamacare, uh, the Affordable Care Act, if, you, if, if one prefers, uh, who does agree with me is a guy named Rob Andrews from New Jersey, a Democrat. He's on the Armed Services Committee. And he's been thinking about trying to use the Pentagon as, as, a, as, a, as a wedge on this, exactly on this issue. Uh, because people you know, don't trust most of the civilian government, but they do sort of salute the flag. And they do understand that the wounded warrior thing is kind of a uh, uh, unbelievable tragedy, and if there's ever something that the country ought to rally around, it's putting these poor young men and women back together again. Um, so you're right, it's an enormous challenge. Uh, the only thing you can hope is that the goal is more attractive than the cynicism of the detractors, and then you can make the sale. Uh, um, well, I guess for the, for the sake of students, I guess they deserve the truth, huh? And, and uh, uh, um, just for all of you with resumes and ambitions and so on, going back to college in the late 70s, uh, I, went to, I was at school out in California. I was about as far away from Washington as you could get. Uh, but I was always sort of interested in politics. I'll give, I'll give myself that. And I, I read the newspaper, an antique document made out of paper that you know, ex 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 existed before the iPad. A and so the answer, your, literally the answer to your question was, I was interested in politics, knew about the Carter administration, the Panama Canal Treaty, and the SALT Treaty, and whatever it was that were the big issues back then, wage and price controls, and so on. And I was attentive to the news. And so through a completely fortuitous chain of circumstances, never underestimate the power of luck, uh, I ended up as a volunteer on the Reagan campaign in Los Angeles in the fall of 79. And, but you know, there are a lot of volunteers. And, and I was just another guy, you know, in a you know, Hawaiian shirt and sandals, you know, waiting around with something to do. And then one, somebody came in one day and said, okay, who here knows who Robert Byrd is? It's a complete coincidence to, to, to Linda over there who worked for Senator Byrd uh, <laughs> at the time. And I said, oh, he's the Senate Majority Leader. Okay, you, come over here. <laughs> And you're now promoted to answering letters. Yeah. So again, all of you in this room, I mean, I, look, I've taught, I've been around politics. I taught at the, at the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington University for five years. And you know, one of the things that kind of staggered me about the experience was that kids, this is graduate school, kids were paying, working in a full-time job and paying 30 grand a year, or whatever it was, on top of that for tuition or getting their parents to pay it, or taking loans, could not be bothered to read the paper. I said, what are you doing here? You know, I mean, I, I, what do you think mayors and governors, and for that matter, senators do? Now, their, their staffs, for reasons I said earlier, are sitting around thinking about what Ayn Rand or Adam Smith or, you know, Karl Marx would want them to say and do and say that. A member of a, par a politician, especially at the local level, but then federal level too, opens up the newspaper or turns on the TV and says, what's going on? The Supreme Court's about to rule on something. I need a statement. I, uh, uh, Obama just did this, or Boehner just did that, or Haslam just did this, or whatever. Am I for it or against it? Am I pointing with pride, or am I viewing with alarm? And you better have some way of handling You better, if you're good at writing a little statement, a little speech, or something like that, which articulates that, you're valuable. But you have to know who these people are. So my, the literal answer to your question is, I had read the paper, and I got promoted to answering letters, and uh, uh, just kept doing it, but I think the, 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 what I've tried to do in, in the 33 years since then is never let myself be a slave to some ideology. Uh, 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 never let myself think that Adam Smith or 
Keynes or who, anybody you could point to had all the answers. Because if you do think that way, then you become dogmatic and it's kind of a secular religion. And then, frankly, you become kind of useless in the kind of give and take of, well, look, look, I mean, as an example, uh, there's a huge article in uh, the new issue of Vanity Fair about, it's called World War 3.0. It's an article about the uh, International Telegraphic Union, which is an organization that existed, as the name suggests, to deal with telegraphs and telegraphy in, the, in 1885. And the organization has morphed since 1885 into, tele you know about this, telegraph, telephone, television, now the internet. They're having a huge meeting in Dubai in December of this year. And it's 11 days, and you should read all, it's quite an interesting article, and it's all these, every issue you can think of, privacy, taxation. Spectrum. Yeah, spectrum, everything is gonna be discussed there. And I guarantee nobody in that room who's actually making decisions about whether the spectrum's gonna be expanded or whatever, is saying, gosh, what does Friedrich Hayek say about this? <laughs> That's exactly what, right. what does the Green Party theoretician say? But they're just not, I mean, those, those, those questions exist and they're not to be completely dismissed, but they're not being discussed there. They're gonna discuss, look, the, the European Union gets this, Asia and China get that, Africa gets this, the United States get that, whatever. It's just a process of knowing what the discussion is. And so all of you young people, if you're interested in politics, and if, and if, if this speech hasn't turned you off politics completely, uh, um, pay attention to what is going through the minds of the voters, because if it's going through the minds of the voters, the politicians are gonna at least have some kind of answer for it. They might not agree, they might be, have, the politicians might be thinking the opposite of what the voter says, but the politicians will be forced to kind of at least have pretend to kind of make some compromise and see if there's any way you can possibly get the vote out of the person, even if they disagree. So that's, that was my epiphany. One more question. Yes, uh, okay. Um, Mr. Pinkerton, Kyle Williams with the Institute of Civic Leadership. So uh, obviously I'm not a, a medical professional, but uh, the information that, the little information that I do that is available to me sort of seems to indicate that, you know, so many of the degenerative diseases that are, you know, afflicting us today have been, you know, largely linked to a lot of environmental factors, namely nutrition, about what we're putting into our bodies um, as far as food and chemicals. Um, why do you think uh, from a policy and, you know, uh, policy standpoint, why that sort of uh, information seems to be neglected and, and instead focused upon prescriptive measures rather than preventative things like nutrition? Uh, uh, well, I mean, th there's, there's, look, take, take cancer. There are three schools of thought on cancer, and they're probably all correct, okay? There's a genetic component. Anybody ever thought of a genetic link between people getting cancer and stuff? You know, bre breast cancer seems to, you know, and, and in different environments. Uh, there's the environmental issue. I, obviously, you know, there, the most obvious thing being smoking, but a lot, plenty of other, benzene, plenty of other things are, cause cancer. And there's also sort of an emerging school of thought on contagion. Uh, everybody kind of agrees that cervical cancer now is contagious. Uh, uh, you go down the list of cancers, uh, you know, uh, uh, head and neck cancers are seeming contagious uh, in a kind of a gross way. Uh, um, I mean, you don't, we don't know the answer to that. Maybe all, the point is clearly all three are, 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 are major factors. Look, cancer is 1.3 million new cases a year. It kills 600,000 people. There's, to, not, to be, not to be light about it, there's plenty of room for everybody. On, on, on this argument. And there's plenty of room for concerted action and the cleaning environment has many benefits beyond a, 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 a averting cancer. Um, but, you know, my grandfather never smoked and died of lung cancer. You know, uh, it happens. So, uh, again, there's, and there's, so there's, it, again, and we're also sort of dealing with what people want. It's sort of the American way to sort of do what you want and then take a pill and fix it, right? And if people will do that and buy the pill, I don't think that's a moral judgment against them. I think that's sort of American. And I also will point out to you, back to economic development, there's sort of an export quality here to this. Uh, if we do it, if we want to eat and smoke and drink and whatever and still live a long time, smoking has pretty much gone away, but eat and drink seems to be surviving pretty well in the culture. Uh, uh, um, so do the Chinese. So do the Indians, so do the Europeans, so does everybody else. And that's a market. And so whoever gets that, uh, you know, we made a lot of money for America in the 80s and 90s selling blockbuster drugs around the world. Uh, they kind of faded away now and so on. But 
Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good business to be in, and if you're looking for something with a high value added quality to it, uh, you can't do much better than this. Uh, you've been talking about Alzheimer's earlier, and, and it's intriguing. I've read that one of the reasons we have an Alzheimer's epidemic is because we've gotten so good at cardiac care and cancer care, and so now we have the opportunity to live long enough to contract Alzheimer's. Uh, one of the new experimental drugs that's being used is an old drug that was proven to not be effective for skin cancer, and they're actually researching with white mice, and that's pretty promising. And so one of the things I wonder about is as you show the bar chart of the FDA approvals, you know, does that include or do they even approve, you know, new uses for existing drugs? Because that does seem to be happening a lot. And then the, the, the real question I want to get to is uh, I'm a dad, and, and do you think it's reasonable for my daughter to live the first 21 years of her life uh, being supported by me and then work for 45 years and then retire at 65 and be funded by the government, all of her health care, no copay with our American let's fix it if it's broken mentality uh, to age 90. So can she be really a load on society for over half of her life and is that a reasonable expectation for her? Uh, okay. Uh, on on the, uh, the drug repurposing issue, I mean, you know, I, the famous example is that, you know, uh, warfarin, which is a rat poison, then turned out to be good at, at ending blood clots. So you never know what you're going to be able to dig up out of the medicine chest and use it for something new and so on. Uh, uh, so who knows what's going to work on Alzheimer's? But I do know this. Is that in your bar chart? Uh, no, no, it's six slides. I'll you know I'll come back <laughs> next year with more. Uh, um, but the, in the New York Times, a couple, uh, uh, summer of 2010, the FDA convened a jury from around the world of every treatment for Alzheimer's that anybody had. Every possible pill, every possible everything, uh, eating broccoli, uh, taking walks, uh, doing crossword puzzles. They put everything in a group and sent all the experts they could find in the area. And you know what they came up with for Alzheimer's treatments? Zero. So whatever, I mean, you know, lots of luck. I mean, and best of wishes to everybody's idea, and it's pretty apparent that there's, you know, and one of the nice things about all this data computer stuff is that there's a lot of people can try all sorts of things on their, on their own and cook up, and maybe it'll work. Maybe it'll go viral, to, to coin a phrase, uh, 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 um, on these things. Um, I, I, my only point on this is we better do something, because we don't do something. Now to your second question about the burden of society, uh, uh, well, one, one point on, on, on disease. Look, in, in 19, in, pardon me, 1800, life expectancy in this country was 35. Okay, and by, 19, by 1900, it had gone up to, I think, 48, and now it's 78. Okay, so all the diseases that used to kill people pretty much went away in the 18th, 19th century, and then a bunch of other diseases went away in the 20th century. Now we're at the 21st century, and the question is, do we, are we happy with where we are? If we are, then we can all just, you know, believe me, the, the Grim Reaper will take, take care of us, and we won't be fighting nature anymore, and we'll live in harmony and be dead. Uh, or we can do what we did for the previous centuries, which is think and grow and change and adapt and be energetic and so on. Um, if we do those things, then we will not only be living longer, we'll also probably be a lot more prosperous. Uh, again, the amount of human capital being, not to be gross about it, being flushed down the toilet every day in terms of people dying uh, is enormous, is incalculable. You know, people with skills and talents and so on who know how to do things are dying at a you know, relative, and it's not just Steve Jobs, it's you know, a lot of famous people, you know, Farrah Fawcett and Patrick Swayze and you know, Christopher Reeve, and people with talents and skills and something to contribute dying young or relatively young. Uh, if we were to do all that, I, I really think we'd have an enormous economic boom on our hands. Um, and then we'd have the luxury of deciding whether or not we want to help people get through high school and college without having to have a job or partial, only partially have a job until they're 21. And we'd have the luxury of saying, well, when do people want to retire from and things like that? It's, you know, uh, 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 Attorney, Attorney Stevens, uh, the, the, the dean here, uh, said, look, I've got a second career here. I was in business. I was in finance. Uh, uh, Linda, I have a second career here. You know, the, 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 you know uh, a lot of us will turn a certain age and then say, look, I'm kind of bored of doing that for a while, whatever it was. And now I'd like to do something. I'd like to give back. I'd like to help. I'd like to do whatever. Maybe they should live another 30 years, too and not really have a job in a formal economic sense, but nonetheless be making a contribution, I think most of us like to think we could do that. We have something to offer, you know, some sort of mentoring, something or other. Uh, so I guess I don't really have an answer to your question about you know, retirement ages and so on. Like, I guess I, I'd like to think that we made enough money as a civilization to, to give a lot of people that choice and let them figure out what they could do best. Uh, 
it, it does not right now, given the current economic growth environment, appear to be sustainable. I mean, when, when this, the age 65 for retirement came from Bismarck in Germany in the 19th century, and when he did it, the life expectancy was 58. He wasn't, he wasn't dumb. <laughs> and, well, okay, so you're right, and so we may well want to be raising it, I guess, and right. that would be my answer is, but a lot, look, a lot of people in this country are physical wrecks at 65. So we can give them lectures about fitness and so on, in which case they'll, they'll vote us out of office. Uh, we can try and inspire by example, which is a much better way to do it. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, or we can think about other technological solutions that help the process. I guess I, my answer is, you know, you never get very far in politics or life or civilization by fighting human nature. You have to sort of deal with it. And if you can deal with it, and 200 plus years of American history says, listen, if you take people kind of as they are and let them be free and let them work hard and sort of do their own thing, you get a lot of pleasant surprises about what they're capable of doing. And that is not only makes for a free and happy country, but also a very prosperous country. And a very prosperous country ought not to be letting this happen. But I better stop there before I, everybody falls asleep or sweats to death. So listen. Thank you so much. One of the things I wanted to. Jim wrote a great article called How Big Data Will Blow Your Mind and Change the 21st Century that I would just encourage especially all the students to look at. So Fox, Fox thank, you, yeah. thank you again so thank, much thank you, for Debbie. being thank you, here. Thank it's you. been wonderful. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you at the next Don R. Elliott lecture right after the elections in January of 2013 when CNBC uh, Senior Vice President and Executive Editor Nick Diogan will join us to look at the president's, whoever the president, president is, the president's economic opportunities and challenges. <laughs>